let me in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ welcome you to this brand new year and to congratulate you as I congratulate myself for the privilege that the Lord has given us to arrive safely in the new year. It is my prayer that as we go through this year, the presence of the Almighty God will journey with us and the grace of God will be sufficient for us in all that we shall do in the name of Jesus. As we rejoice again coming into a new year, we must also express our concern about the reinforcement of the COVID, which is making a lot of people to be sick now. Our prayers are with all those who are healed. We pray that the Lord will lay his healing hands on them and make them whole. And we pray also that as we go through the year, that the Lord will preserve our lives. This sermon ought to be preached by the vicar. But then he started it and he was, he felt sick. So, and he called on me and he said, you have to preach today. And I said, by the grace of God, I will try. And so, part of what he prepared, I must acknowledge that. Because when you take something from somebody in the academic world and you don't acknowledge, we call that plagiarism and I know you know. So, the sermon of today is going to be divided into three parts and then the first part he actually did it and that is the importance of the blood i'll be speaking to you today on the theme the new circumcision the new circumcision and then it is going to be divided into three parts the first will be the importance of the blood and the second will be why circumcision and the third one will be the circumcision of our hearts today by the grace of God is regarded as the feast of the circumcision of our Lord that is our Lord Jesus Christ it is a celebration of the circumcision eight days after his birth the occasion on which the child was formerly given his name, Jesus, a name derived from Hebrew meaning, salvation or savior. The eight days after his birth is traditionally observed January 1. This is in keeping with the Jewish law, which holds that males should be circumcised eight days after birth. And I don't know whether we, do, we still practice that in this other part of the world. The circumcision of Christ became a very common subject in Christian art from the 10th century onward. The event is celebrated as a feast of the circumcision in the Eastern Orthodox Church on January 1. In whichever calendar is used, and is also celebrated on the same day by many Anglicans. It is celebrated by Roman Catholics as the feast of the holy name of Jesus. In recent years, on January 3, as an optimal, optimal memorial. Today, as I said, we are speaking on the new circumcision. Then we need to talk about the importance of the blood. Many people wonder what is it all this talk about circumcision in the New Testament? Is not Christianity past all the shedding of blood and all about just being a good person? In a word, no. Christianity is all about the shedding of blood. And the book of Hebrews records in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. While the late 20th century theological liberal version of the prayer book 
tried to eliminate any mention of blood out of embarrassment. They changed the name of the feast. Such attempts were laughable as it has been restored. Think about our liturgy, the prayer of humble access. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son Jesus Christ and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Blood is still very important to God. And while we are no longer subject to the old law, as we had in last week's epistle from Galatians, we are saved by Jesus Christ's fulfilling of it and the shedding of his blood for us. Jesus himself tells us directly at the Last Supper, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And this also was testified to by Apostle John in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all our sins. Apostle Paul also affirmed the same in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. I could go on and on citing passages for the New Testament, but I don't think that you as a congregation need that. I don't think we struggle to accept this. But why is the shedding of blood important in the Old and New Testament? In the old book of Leviticus, God himself says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, that is Leviticus chapter 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. God himself tells us that all life is a gift, is gift, and he has created his soul that flesh is animated, giving life by the blood. It was God that gave the Old Testament people of God animals to sacrifice, as well as other blood rituals to show that sins cost a severe price. Sin is not just a mystic or something God can overlook because he is a just God. And the sinfulness of all mankind is something that God could not ignore. So then, why circumcision? Why circumcision? Circumcision was a sign of covenant God made with Abraham and his descendants. And that you find in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 to 14. And then there was a reference to that also in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7 and verse 8. The Mosaic law repeated the requirement that all males be circumcised. Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. So every Israelite boy, as well as any man desiring to become part of the Hebrew people, was circumcised. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 48. Since Jesus was a Jew living under the law, he would have been circumcised on the eighth day as well all male Hebrew babies. Luke chapter 2 verse 21 clearly records the fact that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. When it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Later in the same chapter, Luke emphasizes 
that Joseph and Mary follow all the Jewish requirements, doing everything required by the law of the Lord concerning their newborn son. And that we see in verse 39. In following the law, Joseph and Mary will undoubtedly have circumcised Jesus. Failure to do so will have been a clear violation of the law. Jesus spoke in synagogues and taught in the temple courts in Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, also 19, verse 47, if he had been uncircumcised, Jesus would have been excluded from those activities. He would not have been allowed inside those areas. Later in his ministry, Jesus said, I always do what pleases the Father. John chapter 8 and verse 29. Jesus could not have been fully pleasing to God if he had not been circumcised because disobedience to the law cannot be the law giver. One purpose of Jesus coming to the earth was to fulfill the law and that he said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, verse 17 and 18. He, as a man, lived in perfect obedience to God, to all that God had decreed for humanity. In doing so, his life was without spot or blemish and completely acceptable to God. Only as the perfect sacrifice could Jesus provide atonement for sin. So we know that Jesus was circumcised because in that God required it. The law has been fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the law. And then you see the readings of today also confirming the same. And when you look at the college for today, it's also confirming the same. So as Christians, we must be obedient to the laws of God, doing what God commands. We must always strive to do what God commands. This is the beginning of a new year. We cannot afford to negotiate. We cannot afford to say, well, I want to do, but I do not have ability to do. We must do everything within our power to please God this year, to obey that which he has commanded us to do. And he says, if you obey my commandment, you are my friend. And for us to be friends with God, we must obey that which he has commanded us. Then we talk the last aspect of the sermon, the circumcision of our hearts. We have talked about the outward circumcision. How do we connect this? What relevance does this have also to our lives? In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. So for us to have life, our hearts must be circumcised. For us to love God, our hearts must be circumcised. For us to do things that are pleasing to God, our hearts must be circumcised. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4, circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the first skin of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that, that none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. Again, we are told to circumcise our hearts. There is a desire on God's part for a willingness on our part. God wants us to choose to follow him. He wants us because of our love for him to have a heart that wants to do what he says. The verse is telling us God will become angry with our evil ways and punishment we follow if we are unwilling to do spiritual surgery on our hearts. We must circumcise our hearts lest God will become angry with us if we do not circumcise our hearts. In Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, 
which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. We have seen that the two of the passages from the New Testament tell us, in summary, that being a child of God is because of changes of the heart. To be a child of God is not because you now have two heads. It's not because you now have four eyes. It's not because you now become abnormal. The change has only taken place as a result of the circumcision of your heart that has caused a new birth. And that is why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, it's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. That is what caused that change. That your, our hearts are already circumcised. And then we now begin to love God. We now begin to do things that make God to be happy with us. So the inward man, not because of our action that we have taken or religious ceremonies we have taken part in, no, but because of how God has changed our hearts. Now, the way we think now has changed. A lot of things have changed in our lives. And I remember one of the Christian gospel singers in Nigeria who sang many years past, it's late now, and he said, this is the way he composed it. All the bad, bad things I used to do, I do them no more because there is a change now in my life. All the bad places I used to go before, I go no more because there is a change now in my heart. All those bad things I used to think about before, I do it no more now because there is a change in my heart. So when salvation comes to an individual, there is a change that takes place because of faith in the blood of God's Lamb, Jesus Christ. God sent His Holy Spirit into the heart and all things are passed away, as I mentioned. All things become new. No one becomes a Christian through, through doing stuff or participating in religious ceremonies. People become Christians by placing faith in Jesus Christ. And that you see in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Remember the Passover described. Describe you know, the, the complete salvation. That is the description of that Passover. If you bring that Passover to the New Testament, because the Old Testament is like a typology of the New Testament, so if you bring the experience of that of that of that uh, uh, Passover into what we are talking about, Christ sacrificed his blood. And as a result of that, then salvation is given to us. So we see that many people, even in that place then, did not believe. And so the angel of death will go, sorry, let me take it again. Many did not believe the angel of death will go through Egypt that night. They did nothing. And death was the outcome. Those that had faith in the word of God killed the lamb and put the blood on their doorposts. It was their faith in the word and the blood that provided them salvation that night. The Passover was the physical example of spiritual truth. When people believed in the word of God and God's lamb, salvation is attained. The action of putting blood on the doorpost was a result of their faith. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in, whose, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision, made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So the more a heart change the more our changed heart removes sin from our lives, the more complete we are in Christ. And I ask you today, how full are you in Him? Have you had the circumcision of heart? 
at the beginning of the year like this, there is need for us to have our hearts circumcised, to do things that are pleasing unto him, to decide to follow him to the very end of our lives. Once our hearts are circumcised, we shall be led by the Spirit of God. And then finally, I ran off with the readings from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 26. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you are not able to do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, hugs, and like, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have fulfilled, sorry, I'm sorry. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live in the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us become, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. As we continue to look into the perfect law of liberty, which is the scriptures this year, the Almighty God will circumcise our hearts and give us that grace to love Him more and to do things that will make Him to be happy with us throughout this year. We know that the world is passing away with all its players. And then whenever the call comes to us, may we find rest in the bosom of our maker. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.